At Popular Science, we report and write dozens of science and tech stories every week. And while most of the stuff we stumble across makes it into our articles, we also find plenty of weird facts that we just keep around the office. So we figured, why not share those with you? Welcome to The Weirdest Thing I Learned This Week from the editors of Popular Science. I'm Rachel Feltman. I'm Sarah Kylie Watson. I am Sandra Gutierrez. Welcome to the show. Yay! <laughs> I am very excited. Uh, listeners, Sandra is one of our beloved PopSci team members. Uh, why don't you say a little bit about what you do at PopSci? I know we've been planning on having you on Weirdest Thing for a long time, and it has not happened until now. We will remedy this again soon. We yes. want you in the rotation. But please, introduce Amazing. yourself. Yeah, so I'm the Associate DIY Editor at Popular Science. I clean stuff. That's sort of my thing. And I look into the little science bits of everyday things so then you can know what to do and do things yourself. Yeah, you, like, I feel like saying you research the little science bits is really an understatement. <laughs> you are, like, the master of... You know, to to quote a fine sci-fi film, sciencing the shit out of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's part of my job description. So I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. I'm going to stick with it. Awesome. So let's get into it. On The Weirdest Thing I Learned this week, we start by each offering up a little tease about some kind of fact that we found in the course of reading, writing, reporting, cleaning, etc., and decide which one we just absolutely have to hear more about first. Then once we've all had time to spin our little science yarns, we reconvene and decide what the weirdest thing we learned this week actually was. Sarah Kiley, uh, what's your tease? And also, listeners, FYI, we attempted to record this episode last week, and very embarrassingly, I had not checked in with Sarah Kiley, and we had <laughs> the same fact. And Sarah Kiley has graciously, magnanimously, life-savingly offered to find something else <laughs> to talk about. So I bump into a lot of weird stuff. <laughs> I know that I'm editing a bunch of stories every day. Like it's just there's so much weird stuff thrown at me. But I'm really excited about this one. So um, my tease is that this is about how rodent DNA unveiled a 200 year old black market trade. Oh, Ooh. spooky! I love it. I love I love a rodent caper. Um, mm -hmm. My tease, which inexplicably. Somehow, even though it is not a new study, Sarah Kiley and I both initially planned on doing, <laughs> but I will do my best to do it justice uh, for both of us, uh, is that I want to talk about why scientists taught goldfish how to drive, which is a thing they did. <laughs> oh, they did. <laughs> what? I, I am so very curious that you, both of you knew the answer to this, and I didn't, and now I'm like, well, tell me more. <laughs> That's that's what weirdest thing is all about. It's just a a Venn diagram of weird things we know and most people do not because no one needs to know this much weird stuff. That's weirdest thing TM. Um <laughs> Sandra, what's your tease? Okay. I'm very excited about this. Uh, I'm going to tell you the story of how illegal drugs might be the key to the future of organ transplantation sparkly emoji. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> so many drugs it could be, just just illegal drug. So uh, I'm excited to hear more. Uh, what do we want to start with? I I can I can get us going as yeah. the goldfish okay, did. Okay. We can hit the road. As the oh, goldfish, yeah. press on did. the goldfish gas. <laughs> Great. Let's do goldfish then. All right. So, um, about a year ago, researchers in Israel published evidence that goldfish can learn to drive tanks. Of course, I mean fish tanks on wheels. Uh, though <laughs> I do also love imagining them. I was about. I was about to ask war tanks. Um, so the researchers crafted what they called. FOVs, fish operated vehicles, of course, um, which basically amounted to fish tanks secured to motorized wheels. The The motorized wheel rig looks kind of like um, a DIY version of like a Mars rover, like maybe something you would see in uh, a very 
impressive high school robotics competition. Uh, and then the rig also included uh, a little camera, which was hooked up to a Raspberry Pi computer. Very useful for DIY applications, of course. We talk about those on popsci.com all the time. Um, and it was pointed down <laughs> into the water so that it could track the movements of the fish inside. And then it translated them into wheel movements based on a simple algorithm. <laughs> so basically, fish goes in the tank, swims around in the center, nothing happens. But when it swims in a particular direction until it bumps up against the glass while continuing to face that direction, then the fish-operated vehicle <laughs> will move accordingly. So basically, to move the car forward, uh, the fish is sort of like nosing the tank along like it's rolling a ball and the wheels are responding appropriately. Uh, the researchers placed a pink board somewhere in the room that they were doing the experiment in. And the fish were given a food pellet the moment their tank mobile successfully tapped the target. Uh, and after a few days, the six goldfish, who it feels very important to note, were named after Pride and Prejudice characters. Yes. Um, oh, my gosh. I love that. Yes, I love that. The kind of detail I love. <laughs> um, they <laughs> all learned how to steer their FOVs to the snack zone, um, which is honestly like more than I have done behind the wheel of a car in many years. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, I love this next zone, by the way. Yeah. Like, I just I just <laughs> picture the goldfish, like, headbutting the wall of the tank and just like, welcome to the snack zone. I, just love I that. have I'm to sorry. hope the researchers, you know, had a, an appropriate amount of fanfare for the fish reaching the snack zone target. But um, we'll never know unless they decide to tell us. Uh, <laughs> so the fish were able to navigate the vehicle even from different starting points in the room. So they weren't just like memorizing, oh, you know, swim forward uh, for this long and then like turn turn your head this way and that means you get food. They were like finding this, this pink target in the room. Um, and they even managed to ignore false targets that were placed around the room using different colors. And they <laughs> even were able to recover and redirect when their tank mobile bumped into walls, which, again, <laughs> that's better driving than I've done in a long time. Um, apparently, again, this feels very important to note, Mr. Darcy and Mr. Bingley were the best drivers in the bunch. Oh, good to know. <laughs> of course. Of course. So when I first read about this study, uh, some of the coverage I saw seemed to imply that the point was showing that fish could figure out like the mechanism of operating a vehicle as opposed to just swimming. And I found that very perplexing because like, how could you prove that a fish didn't simply think its tank like got bigger every time it bumped its nose against the wall? Like, you don't know, mm. you don't know what the fish is thinking. Uh, so there's no way to say the fish understood that by swimming up against the wall, it was operating a car so you can't prove that the fish learn to like drive in a philosophical sense. Um, yeah, you can't do that. And that absolutely wasn't the point of the study. So <laughs> uh, that's that's not an issue. Um, the point was to see whether goldfish have some innate sense of logic when it comes to the challenge of navigating a space. Like, is a fish able to execute a task like figure out how to get to the food place when the food place is not in an aquatic environment. Um, it's definitely kind of like heady and philosophical, at least if you don't spend your time studying fish brains, but it's still way more interesting and like tangible than can fish drive. The question is like, what does it mean for a fish to be able to navigate and like how many factors can you take out of that equation to try to prove they have some inherent ability to say, like, this is the space I'm in. These are the the obstacles. These are the turns. And I'm looking for this thing in this space. Um, does that make sense? Again, it's kind of it, it does. 
it does make sense. I was actually going to say, well, that requires a very special Google Maps navigation tool to get around. But then you went into the whole philosophical <laughs> thing. And I was like, oh, wow, this is much deeper than that. OK, I'm digging it. Right. So not so much about the question of whether a fish can conceptualize a car, which which would be uh, a very silly study, though, if someone out there has tried it. I'm sure it was really valuable and that you do really good science, but it's not what we're doing today. So yeah, the purpose of the fish-operated vehicle was just to make it possible for a fish to navigate in a non-aquatic space. So it doesn't matter what the fish thinks is happening when it makes the tank move. What matters is that the fish is figuring out the best way to get to an arbitrary target using extremely non-fish native wayfinding points like walls and like tables in a room. Um, and again, the perspective is going to be all warped because they're they're clearly not swimming through a room full of water. So yeah, to just summarize one more time, it's it's about taking away everything that makes a fish navigating in the water not have to do with like knowing how to figure out and navigate a space. Fascinating stuff. <laughs> wow. See, I've always like thought of it as a reverse submarine. Yeah, like, it like, is a reverse submarine. Like, that is a very good go way to put it, yeah. It's kind of like, what would people do if you put them in hamster wheels that were completely airtight and stuck them in the ocean? Oh, you know, totally. And they somehow? Right, well, wow. so it's and like, like we would, it's, it is about like trying to figure out how similar they are in, in terms of what navigation means for them. Because like, yes, humans learn how to be particularly adept at like familiar environments, but also like the way our brain works is that the point of being able to navigate is that if you get dropped into like a totally unfamiliar, like even if you got dropped into a blank void, you'd be like, okay, how do I figure out where is where in this void? You wouldn't be like, I don't know what physical space is anymore because I'm no longer in my familiar environment. So your results may vary. It's probably pretty freaky to get dropped into uh, a void. And frankly, I think the fact that these fish didn't just have little existential crises and um, melt down in the corner means they did better on this test than probably I would have done. Um, Good for them. Yeah. Good for them. I, I want their therapist number for sure. <laughs> they were even able to approach their targets from like a wide variety of different angles, which suggests that they had some internal representation of this strange world around them. Um, and they got faster over time. So all of this helps support the idea that the way we navigate space which we know has to do with parts of our hippocampus that are pretty similar in all vertebrates, including these little goldfish, um, has more to do with some innate inner mind mapping tools uh, than it does with like species specific ways of figuring out an environment, which is not to say we don't also have those because there are loads of animals who are uh, really well adapted to specifically navigating the kinds of environments they live in, humans included. But we also have like an innate ability to like look around, become spatially aware. Your results may vary. I don't have very good spatial awareness, but it exists. <laughs> Me neither. It, there is, a, I'm aware that there is a space. Um, now, just one, one thing to end this is that uh, there was a study published in 2019 that genuinely taught rats to drive little cars that they operated with toggles made out of copper wires. And the point of that study really was to uh, to teach rats to drive, not just propel themselves around in a strange new way. Um, the idea was to actually to show whether growing up in so-called enriched environments, which for a lab rat means like cages with multiple levels to climb on and interesting stuff to play with. It doesn't mean the other rats were like actively mistreated or neglected. It's just that they were in like a standard, <laughs> a standard rat enclosure. And the enriched environments were more like what you would expect someone to get for a pet rat. You know, um, there was fun stuff in there, not just stuff to keep them from being miserable and starving to death. Um, relatable. <laughs> Sometimes we must enrich our environments uh, ourselves. Um, 
So the question was whether growing up in an enriched environment made rats better able to learn stuff and less likely to be stressed out about encountering new things um, and having to to learn a new skill, uh, which, you know, obviously uh, the one of the reasons they're looking into that is because there's a big question of how the environments we grow up in, um, you know, affect how our brains work and uh, kind of our resilience and our um, intelligence and uh, socialization skills. So uh, very, very obvious reasons to want to understand, uh, even in a rodent model, um, how having fun stuff around and cool new things to do all the time might change the way you grow up. Um, so what's funny is that there didn't turn out to be much difference in stress level. All the rats apparently felt pretty chill about driving, at least like hormonally. Um, so that's nice. I'm glad that they had a fun uh, had a fun time cruising. Um, but the enriched environment rats uh, were more likely to keep wanting to drive around even when there was no food for them to win by doing so. They just wanted to like mouse on a motorcycle it around the enclosure. Um, listen, listen, driving can be very relaxing for a lot of people. So I'm not surprised rats think the same. I, I would probably like driving a lot more if I got to do it around a little enclosed space just for fun. 100%. With a cute Absolutely. little, makes it not fun. It's cute little DIY car just for me. Sometimes getting a snack when I did a good job driving. <laughs> yes. I think. Um, yeah, you, you stopped at the intersection. Here's a little treat for yeah, you. Yeah, I think I'd be a very different driver, uh, have a very different relationship with driving <laughs> if. Uh, that's how I learned. Um, so anyway, uh, that is that is why goldfish sort of learn to drive and rats really learn to drive. And I just love experiments where they have to make cute little rigs for animals to do human things so much. OK, now my question is the rats and the goldfish, when they listen to Olivia Rodrigo, do they feel something? <laughs> oh, do they do they feel the. I got my license, driver's license That's last week. That's the question. Can they relate? Can they relate? <laughs> I don't know. I feel like having a car existential, existential crisis and understanding music probably are on the same level of brain power. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if the goldfish would. They it's one, like, or the one or the <laughs> other. One or the other, dude. Amazing. OK, we're going to take a quick break and then we'll be back with some more facts. Okay, we're back. And uh, Sarah Kylie, let's let's talk about your fact. I want to hear about some some rodent mysteries, please. Yeah. Well, so actually, the rodents are kind of like, you know, like a feature, but they're not the star of the show. So the star of the show is fur seals. So we're still going to talk about animals because that's my favorite thing to do. <laughs> but... We're going to backtrack it a little bit. So about 150 years ago, um, sealers in New Zealand nearly brought fur seals, also known as kekano, to extinction. So we're talking about 18th century-ish. We're having some trouble with keeping the fur seals alive. Um, nowadays, they're doing a lot better. The last recorded count that I could find was 2001. And even then, it was 200,000 of them. Um, little fuzzy, cute seals bouncing around the rocky shores um, throughout mainland New Zealand and parts of Australia and all of that. So they're doing better. Preface with a little positive note. But um, before we dive into the sealing, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the geography of New Zealand because there's two islands and they're only 25 kilometers apart, but they're quite different actually. So the North Island is home to um, the biggest city in the country, Auckland, and it's got a warm climate. It's got volcanoes and surfing beaches and all of that really fun stuff. The South Island is cold, quiet, and where they filmed Lord of the Rings. So very different vibes. Um, but I know this South from Island an episode of the TV show Rocket Power. <laughs> 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 they did a surfing and snowboarding combo competition in New Zealand. That's all. Just felt very important to note. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is. This is probably the only that I didn't know anything about this, so I need to watch more Rocket Power. 
um, clearly. But we're going to be talking about the South Island, um, the Lord of the Rings Island, the Cold Island. Um, and back in the day, um, fur seals were really dominant here. And uh, because we have to, I'm going to talk about fur seals and give you a little description of what they are like. So they're really, really, really cute. They have pointy noses and whiskers, and they have hind flippers that rotate so they can like waddle across land. Um, but if you're like a sealer or you hunt seals, the crucial bit is probably their double layered coat of fur um, because that's very valuable. They can get really big and chunky. Uh, an adult male can weigh like 330 pounds and be eight feet long. So they're gigantic. Um, they're expert fishers. They chase after like squid and barracudas and mackerel. And some females can dive 780 feet into the water and then hang out down there for like 11 minutes. So Dang. they're adorable and they're kind of baddies. They're tough little flubbery creatures Cutie but a baddies. century ag- i love that yeah the seal baddies i love them um but a century ago their story was very tragic um so as most of my stories go we just go backwards and backwards and backwards until we can go forwards <laughs> so we're gonna go ahead and go backwards a little bit so the hunting of these animals again with the maori people the folks that lived on new in new zealand and the cook islands before europeans arrived They supposedly originated from East Polynesia, rowing over in waves of canoe voyages in the 1300s to settle in New Zealand, and their culture, as it does over centuries of isolation, became distinct from other Eastern Polynesian ones. But as the story of colonization often goes, by around 1877, they were forced to assimilate into Western culture, and there were social upheaval epidemics, and it took their pull took a toll on the population. Progress has been made um, to get these folks social justice in their home nation, but of course that's hardly a simple story. And now they have about 900,000 of their people in New Zealand, making up about 17% of the population. But fast forward. So we're going to go back to the like early days, the canoe days, 1300s. So we've got people on New Zealand and they need to eat and survive. And fur seals, along with a smaller group of elephant seals, make for pretty ideal prey. And before people arrived, these creatures were all over the coast of New Zealand. Um, But this naturalist, Johann Reinhold Forster, recorded that they make a quote-unquote most excellent and palatable food by far oh, more no. tender juicy and delicate than beef steaks so <laughs> jesus christ more delicate than beef steaks they were a bit doomed to be hunted um not to mention all the other stuff that comes with them including their seal teeth which make for really great fishing hooks so yeah and so a lot of this came from um new zealand's government encyclopedia which there's not a ton of recorded information about the fur seal trade in new zealand so you know, take everything with a grain of salt. A lot of these sources are from like the 17 and 1800s. So obviously grain of salt with everything that comes from a couple hundred years ago. But um, according to that encyclopedia, in the first two centuries of settlement, the Maori were often more seal hunters than moa hunters, which moa were a big um, bird that also went extinct around the same time that humans showed up. Um, And some records show that it took like a century to wipe out these giant birds. But back to the encyclopedia. There's evidence of extensive sealing in the far north. However, by the 1700s, seals were confined to the far south. So they're confined to Lord of the Rings area. And so fast forward a few decades, um, Europeans like James Cook are arriving um, in 1773. Cook spent time in the Dusty Sound, which was was by fate would have it, um, one of the places where the seal populations were still like kind of bustling. And so um, next part is really sad. And so I didn't have it in me to like write it out in my own words. So this again comes from the encyclopedia. But Cook's men shot or clubbed the seals for food and used their skins for repairing rigging and their oil for lamps. Their potential as trading item was especially noted in Sydney. From 1788, merchants in the new convict settlement were seeking ways of paying for imports. The London firm of Sand Enderby and Sons, who were active in transporting convicts to Sydney and had a license in the East India Trading Company, arranged for the Britannia, for the Britannia to drop a sealing gang in Dusky Sound in November 1792. They were to procure skins for the Chinese market as payment for tea. But when the men were picked up in September 1793, they had collected 4,500 skins and had also built New Zealand's first sailing ship. However, the opening of Australia's Bay Strait rookeries in 1797 diminished the attraction of New Zealand. So as things would go, people show up and we start clubbing the poor animals, um, which is pretty grim. And so this went on for a while. Um, But a few years later in the 1800s, the rookeries were exhausted and traders started to look for, to make business with England. And they also still needed seal products, fur for hats, leather for shoes, seal oil for lighting and industrial processes. But by this time, things had gotten kind of sketchy. Um, You can only like really like raid a island for their animals for so long without things getting a little question mark or a little bit legal. Um, 
mostly because the East India Company's monopoly in the area. It wasn't even anything about like, oh, poor seals. It was just a monopoly. Um, so after the rush to the Dusky Sound happened in 1803, hunters moved around and they were being sneaky with their locations. American sealers hit the Antipodes, Bounty, and Auckland Islands, and there were years where in three years, 140,000 seals were killed in, that, in the first island alone. And a few years later, um, sealers were back at a couple of other spots. Two years after that, there was an elephant seal oil rush in the Macari and Campbell Islands. Um, by 1810, things were slowing down. There were only a few crows, like, still popping around sealing. Um, by 1820s, duties on colonial oil were remo- removed and people needed seal skins again. So the rookeries bounced back. Uh, but that faded. So it's kind of like an up and down roller coaster. Mm. Um, and by that time, most of the, like, workers that were doing this stuff were based on the shore. They weren't, like, coming over from somewhere. And there were more Maori becoming involved. But there's some interesting um, stuff about who these people people were that were sealers and so if you didn't catch it before a lot of um the people that were sealers were coming from australia which had become kind of like a convict colony Mm -hmm. and so most of the sealing was organized by sydney companies and they're all almost all founded by ex-convicts such as simon lord and remember that name for later um and there are like a couple of american ones but the monopoly really restricted how much people could get in there um the encyclopedia called the the men a tough breed of sea rats um, some former okay. sailors and other ex-convicts. And so some joined gangs after stowing away on ships from Sydney. So things are just bananas. Um, and they're paid basically um, a hundredth of the take of the skins and oil collected. So they did not make a ton of money. The life was hard. Um, gangs of men would be like left on coasts of islands for months at a time, kind of like pirates. Like one group su- survived on this like rocky island for four and a half years before they were rescued. Um, they'd live in caves and rocks and under boats that we- they turned upside down. Swarms of rats were everywhere. The men were constantly cold and wet. Fresh water was scarce, and they lived off of dry cakes, seal meat, or fish, and suffered from scurvy a lot of the time. Um, After his time as a sealer, this one guy noted in his journal in 1820 that he had become changed from the delicate youth to about as rough a piece of goods as ever ever weathered the wide world. So it's really no fun for anybody, it doesn't sound like, except for the people making a bunch of money. The seals aren't having a good time. The people that are doing it doesn't sound like it's a good time. It's a lose-lose situation for sure. And I would have quit that job it's real bad. immediately. Oh my gosh. If I'm going to have to like kill animals and you're going to leave me on an island for four years, like it's not happening for me. It's no. not. No. But anyway, back to the timeline. 1830s, um, most of these guys had had enough, blessedly. They were supplementing income with crops and timber and some of them even transitioned to whaling and sealing kind of became like a, like a side hobby for whalers because I guess it is like kind of, what do you think about it? I guess... Pretty similar. Um, like you're in the open sea and you're like hunting for a whale. You, you might might as well just do this other thing while I'm at it. Right. I guess. Like it's kind of it kind of makes sense. And by 1875, the population of seals had shrunk so much that hunting was only allowed in the winter. And then 20 years after la- that, um, there were no more open sealing sealing seasons except for two exceptions in the early 1900s. Um, the last sealing, the last official legal one, was in 1946, um, which ended up with about six thousand seals killed um so that was the last time they were legally killed so that's more information than anybody's ever wanted to know about the new zealand (laughs) sealing history um and now we're going to get to the rats or the rodents should i say so now we've powered through all of that um time to get to the weirdest bit the weirdest thing of my weirdest thing (laughs) how rodent dna laid bare an illegal sealing scheme between new zealand and asia So beyond just physical difference between the North and the South Islands, the rats and mice are different on these two islands. And that's really, really weird because it's only 25 kilometers apart. So So, yeah, but I guess that's far enough for a rat to not swim it. To not swim. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Hashtag evolution. (laughs) Yeah, it's enough, but it's still a little weird considering how much was going back Mm, and forth and back and forth. Right, like ships, you would think. Yeah, Yeah. like, and the mice aren't doing any swimming, but... They're hot, they're stowing away like the um, the gang members on the <laughs> sealing boats, but um, a couple of years ago, a zoologist um, named Carolyn King, um, she was looking into the differences between the North and the South Island mice. As it turns out, the house mice on the North Island were descendants of hitchhikers that stowed away from Europe on the ships of British colonialists. Mm-hmm. So, they're European mice. The South Island had a totally different mouse, completely different 
related instead to the Southeast, Southeast Asian mouse, a subspecies that is widespread in China, but it's never been found outside of e- Asia. Hmm. So, a little weird. A few years later, King and her team compared the rodent DNA with genetic material from 19th century rat and mouse specimens unearthed near Sydney's port. And as suspected, the city mice also had European roots, but the Chinese transplant mice, nowhere to be found. So basically, these little creatures are scampering evidence of a connection between the South Island and China Mm. in the 1800s when all the sealing business was going down. However, there's no historical records um, in English that show China and New Zealand were trading at the time. So it's a little bit mysterious. And so King um, recently offered up kind of an ex- a scandalous explanation, if you will, as reported by Hakai. Hakai was the only um, article I found written about this at all. So shout out to them for letting me read their page a million times. But um, the rodents basically arrived with the traders who sailed to China to illegally sell the pelts of New Zealand fur seals. And then they returned to the South Islands in the 1800s. Um, these seal rookeries like dotted the South Island. So they're everywhere. And pelts were kind of the only thing the island had to offer at the time when it turned in turn of like commodities for trading and whatnot. And in what was then called Canton, um, a bustling South China port city, um, it was kind of the background of international trade. These fur seal pelts were becoming more and more valuable because um, sea otters and their fur were actually becoming scarce because people were doing this to animals everywhere. And so if you were feeling ballsy enough to go ahead and do some illegal trade with these fur pelts like you could make a fortune doing this and obviously if you're a a sealer life is already like really hard um so it's not that shocking people probably went a little bit around the edges of the law to make a little bit more money but yeah at this time again with the monopoly that we were talking about earlier um the the british east india company was like don't trade with china and india because they just wanted to keep things locked tight which made seal hunting um like you know more like being like a little sneaky pirate or something. So apparently there is some rumor of who might have been doing this. Ooh. So uh, a historian in New Zealand actually said there's rumors floating around like 200 years after the deed. Um, so apparently in 1806, colonial authorities busted Simon Lord, who we were talking about before. Um, they caught him in Sydney for shipping 87,000 seal skins collected in the Antipodes Islands south of New Zealand to Canton via Sydney. So basically, we just unearthed the true bits of this 200-year-old rumor thanks to little stowaway mice, um, which is the story for today. Oh, I love I that. I love that. I, I also... I love when the tea gets spilled. What, it, what an adventure for those mice. Bless them. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing God's work. They're solving mysteries and being mice. Oh, I mean, it's really cute. I'm imagining the mice solving little crimes. It makes me think of those rescuers down under movies. Oh god. Yeah, I remember the down under movies. Rev it back up. Dang. We've got a new story. Driving around in their little cars solving crimes. Solving crimes. <laughs> I mean, of course, that's what they do. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break and then we'll be back with one more fact. All right, we're back. And uh, I would like to hear about some illegal drugs, please. Um, Please, of course. <laughs> I am very glad to oblige. Okay, but first, I want to tell you the story about how I came across this weird factoid because it's, it's, it's sort of funny. Okay, so this was right around this time of year, so January 2022, that the world was celebrating the first successful xenotransplantation of a genetically modified pig's heart into a human body, which is awesome, okay? But the word successful here is a little bit ironic. So the surgery was indeed a success, meaning that the patient, a 57-year-old man called David Bennett Sr., didn't die on the table during the procedure. However, he did die two months later in March, though apparently his death had nothing to do uh, with organ failure. So yay, that's good news. Um, Now, xenotransplantation, which is the technical term for transplanting tissue such as organs from one species to another, has been making a lot of progress in the last couple of years. And before Dr. Mohamed Muhedin and the medical team at the University of Maryland School of Medicine completed the transplant of the pig's heart, another team at NYU had successfully done something similar with a porcine kidney in 2021. 
And, you know, like most people, I was completely in awe by this medical breakthrough. And as one does, I got absolutely obsessed with it because, of course, why not? So I started consuming uh, a lot about it. Uh, I was reading articles. I was listening to podcasts. I was diving deep into the deepest rabbit holes of TikTok. You name it. I was there. <laughs> so one day I was walking my dog and I was listening to an episode of Today Explained. And when the host mentioned only in passing, which is baffling to me, that before the actual transplant took place, the pig's heart had to soak in a very special solution. This particular concoction, whose recipe is, of course, proprietary, contained a mix of around 10 different hormones, including some cortisol, a dash of adrenaline, and a very special ingredient, one gram per liter of dissolved cocaine. I knew it. I had a feeling in my heart. This is I a mean, Coke story. Of course it is. I mean, you got little white powders in your kitchen for a reason. You know, <laughs> little white powders here also make sense. So this is funny because for years, doctors have turned down potential heart donors with a history of cocaine use, mm. mainly because of the belief that the drug might affect the quality of the organ, making it unsuitable for transplant. So there are recent studies contradicting this belief and stating that there's not a huge difference between the hearts of donors who have never tried Coke and donors who have a history of consuming the drug in a non-intravenous way. So, you know, snorting it. But transplant centers routinely decline tissue from this type of donor due to the concern over cardiac complications. So uh, let's go back to the Coke brew. It was developed in Lund University in Sweden by Dr. Stig Steen. I am definitely butchering his name, so my apologies. Uh, he has dedicated his life to researching organ transplantation, especially heart and lungs. And he uses pigs because, in case you didn't know, swine physiology and anatomy are very much like ours. So up to a certain degree, you can easily extrapolate results from there and apply them in clinical studies with humans, which is cool because you don't want to butcher people to save other people. It just doesn't make sense. Although, hashtag capitalism. Anyway. Also, so, hashtag the history of medicine. But I mean, I'm glad of course. we evolved from that. I'm, so. We're trying. We're trying. trying. We're getting there. It's, it's a long way off, but you know. Uh, so in 2016, Steen publishes a paper on how injecting pigs with a solution he gave the very cutesy name of Brain Death Cocktail... <laughs> I know, I know. This is insane. I read about it and I was like, wait a minute. You didn't come up with a better name for that? But anyway. I feel like that's the name of a mixed drink at like a really bad college bar. Yeah. And of course I mean? it has it has like a monster energy drink in it. Like it has to. But <laughs> like it's just horrifying. Yes, I wouldn't drink that. But anyway, uh, the brain death cocktail could stabilize the pig's heart for up to 24 hours after harvesting so that they're still eligible for successful transplantation. And just if you're curious, the name stems from the moment when the brew was injected into the swines, which was 30 minutes after they were brain dead, like very brain dead. So it wasn't that this was the cocktail that induced brain death. Yeah, no, it isn't. But again, g God, like you can or come up with a better your cocktail would be fine. Right? Yeah. No. Like but, uh... I, I don't, I don't it's know. It's like brain cocktail, brain brew, <laughs> picks heart with a um, you know, with a little brain umbrella. Brew. I, I don't know. There's so many possibilities. You could have come up with something better, Doctor Steen. I'm sorry, but. You know, now in general, heart transplants are extremely delicate in that you need to put that ticker into the recipient's body within one to two hours after harvesting. Otherwise, the probability of the procedure going south increases way too much, and it's not even worth it, you know, attempting the procedure. At the moment, there's no research that shows that if Dr. Steen's Coke brew works in human hearts. But since the team at the University of Maryland was using a pig's heart, they decided to try the solution to give themselves a bigger chance at success as possible. So they imported the Coke brew from Sweden from a company called Ex Vivo, which is giving evil zombie company from like a video game or manga, but that's just me. In an interview with Science, Dr. Muhideen, who led the team at the University of Maryland, explained that the fact the solution contained cocaine created a headache because each time they imported it, they had to get the Drug Enforcement Administration involved <laughs> and get a permit. Because, I mean, getting drugs into this country is not easy, whether you try it legally or illegally. So there was a lot of paperwork going on, and apparently it was really, really annoying. 
And now to the million dollar question, because I bet that you've been wondering this from the time I started talking. Why Coke? That is very weird. So Steen's 2016 paper says that the preservation of a potential donor's heart should start with optimizing the blood circulation in the donor, meaning in this case, the pig. So to do that, doctors try to increase blood pressure by injecting the system with a hormone called noradrenaline or norepinephrine. But the substance is not as efficient as it can be because the chemical changes that happen in the pig's brain post-mortem make it so that the body absorbs noradrenaline way too fast. So it cannot do much. But good news. This is great. Here's where blow comes to save the day. (laughs) It just so happens that the drug is a pretty good reuptake blocker, which means it prevents noradrenaline from being absorbed, effectively helping normalizing blood pressure. Now, exactly how this translates into the brain death cocktail helping keep tissue healthy and functioning for longer before a surgical procedure, we do not know. Trade secret. Trade, uh, yeah, and again, it's proprietary. So, I mean, we can expect more research, but we don't actually know. So, I mean, not even Muhadin knows, Dr. Muhadin. So, Dr. Muhadin said to science that the deprivation of blood flow and oxygen when the heart is being removed from the pig's chest may somehow deplete the mitochondria in the organ cells. And apparently, the Coke brew might be able to help with that. But that's just a theory, and we need to wait until more research is done so we get more answers. In the meantime, the future of pig organs in human bodies, it is uncertain, but it is slowly progressing. So research is still ongoing, and there's a lot of bureaucracy involved, which is really a bummer. The medical team at the University of Maryland only got approval from the Food and Drug Administration to try this procedure on a specific patient. So they'll have to do it all over again if another qualified candidate comes around. And because we're talking about organ transplantation here, that is a big, huge, tremendous if. But... You know, in the meantime, Dr. Muhadin and his team are doing tests on baboons, hoping to show long-term survival rates and get FDA approval for a multi-center trial to advance their approach in xenotransplantation. And this could eventually make organ transplants safer and increase organ availability worldwide, saving millions and millions of lives in coming years. And that is all, well, not all, but at least in part, thanks to Blow. (laughs) It is great. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, I'm so like, you know, it's so interesting that cocaine was the thing to go with, not like anything else. There's there's so many drugs, including ones that actually get prescribed for things. (laughs) I'm just laughing about the DEA, like being at University of Maryland, like, here's your safe coke professors (laughs) professors like <laughs> I mean <laughs> Can you imagine I just I just imagine Dr. M- uh, Muhadin's team saying like oh my god we ran out of the concoction we're gonna have we're gonna have to order some again can you just call Phil from the DEA Jesus Christ <laughs> like <laughs> it must be so annoying yeah I mean um I'm sure uh well of course it sounds like more research is needed I'm sure if there was an an easier <laughs> to work with they would have gone for it Um, absolutely absolutely but this is very good news and again uh the patient they try this on died after two months but the fact that his death was not due to organ failure is really really good news and here's hoping that they can make more progress and again this can change the whole organ transplantation game forever i mean i'm being being very hopeful here but you know this could be really good so yay blow (laughs) (laughs) absolutely um well what was the weirdest thing we learned this week a lot of a lot of good stuff. I mean, I have to say, the cocaine was pretty weird. It's pretty wild. So uh, I think that's our winner. I think so, too. We had the triple Cs. We had cocaine, crimes, and cars, which is <laughs> always a good. That. That's a great theme. <laughs> the old, an old Grand Theft Auto episode of Weirdest Thing. Um, we love it. But yeah, congratulations, but yeah. Sandra. And, and we hope to have yes. you on again very soon. I hope so, too. I had a blast. The Weirdest Thing I Learned This Week is produced by all of our hosts, including me, Rachel Faltman, along with Jess Bodie, who also serves as our audio engineer and editor extraordinaire. Our theme music is by Billy Cadden. 
Our logo is by Katie Belloff. If you have questions, suggestions, or weird stories to share, tweet us at weirdest underscore thing. Thanks for listening, weirdos.